so the, to start with the, the discussion if you understand the international dynamics in the maritime security uh, maritime security region especially those that concerns india and questionably the indian ocean and the extended pacific uh, is a contemporary arena of a great strategic game where multiple players are trying to that trying to display their own strategic skills and whether these convergences the upcoming convergences or the management of contestation uh, will define the days to come or not is certainly an area we have to explore because ladies and gentlemen what kind of threat is uh, threats do we see in the maritime sphere is very unprecedented it could be the aggression of a state which is trying to extend its maritime border it could be pirates it could be non state actors uh, or it could be uh, terrorists for that reason so to ascertain some of the intern, uh, international dynamics some of the important dynamics that concerns in india's international trade we have mr pk ghosh and mr nihir dr probal ghosh is former indian naval officer and scas fellow with the outstanding prerogative of being both lead co chairman and india representative at two consecutive CSCAP international study groups on maritime security he has uh, served the orf and he has worked with uh, delegates from nearly 22 countries uh, and prepared two memorandums that was forwarded to the arf summit meet he has served many think tanks including inclusive of holding a position as a senior fellow at observer research foundation and he has also worked with uh, center for air power studies as a senior fellow being one of its kind he was the first senior research fellow at national maritime foundation ladies and gentlemen dr ghosh is also the holder of prestigious professor ds kotari drdo chair at the united service institution and he has also been a research fellow at the manohar parikar institute of defense studies and analysis for nearly two tenures let me also take the privilege of welcoming mr mehir shekhar konsale he is an independent strategic affairs and foreign policy analyst based in kolkata previously he has worked as a faculty expert at the strategic studies program of observer research foundation for nearly 8 years mr mehir has authored many research articles focusing upon india's bilateral agreements with its neighbors including bhutan china and myanmar he has published papers on a range of topics that include sino indian border issues india south power and religion in south asia the rohingya crisis india myanmar relations and also bhutan's uh, transition to democracy it's a privilege having you both here let me first hand over uh, the platform to dr ghosh and he will be speaking on the subject it will be followed by mehir sir and we will take the question and answers later i request the host to give the host controls to dr ghosh sir thank you sir over to you uh thank you thank you uh, so much for the kind words and uh, um i would like to at the outset uh thank uh, the host for giving this opportunity to speak and it's very good to see you me here um i think after a long time uh nice meeting you and uh, sharing the panel with you uh what i'll do is i'll be um and of course thanks to rohit for giving me this opportunity like i said um what i'll be doing is i'll be speaking about uh, maritime security uh in the ocean oceanic uh, neighborhood that is the indian ocean and then i'll be talking about the sea trade in the indian ocean region with special reference to india because that's what we are concerned with but since it involves everybody i'll be speaking uh, about the general uh, oceanic trade yeah so now um, i'll be uh, speaking about this maritime security and sea trade in the indian ocean region with special reference to uh, our india indian context of course uh, a small quote the indian ocean is particularly heightened and concentrated form of global reality embodied in maritime commerce uh firstly the security issues uh, i must tell you that maritime security involves a lot of issues uh most of them have a relevance to the sea trade which um, 
uh, grows extensively in the Indian Ocean region. Issues like piracy, terrorism, illegal arms transfer, drug running, they're all there. And um, they're all transnational in their characteristics. We all know how Somalian piracy um, can have a significant effect on the global uh, seaborne commerce. In fact, uh, my special paper on Somalian piracy was taken by the Indian government and uh, out of the five uh, recommendations, three were presented at the UN Security Council uh, as to how to solve uh, the issues of Somalian piracy. I'm very happy for that. But um, one of the main issues uh, which we have to deal with is slot security or sea lanes of communication, and that is of the biggest importance. Um, all this requires transnational cooperation, and uh, that is why India has been helping our neighboring countries, friendly countries, um, for building up capacity. And um, we have, of course, the initiatives like the Indian Ocean Naval Symposium. Uh, yours truly was one of the authors of this IONS, which has now about nearly 30 members, 30 countries, and um, IORA, ADF, uh, ADM Plus, uh, ADM and Plus, and all that can be used for overcoming these challenges. Now, what are the main security issues? I have just put this out over here. Human trafficking, light arms transfer, uh, trafficking, uh, narcotics, war, severe crisis, terrorism, and piracy. I've put them all over there for your perusal. Now, I talked of slock security. Um, Slock security is the ones through which the ships go. That is sea lanes of communication. The ships don't go all over the place. They follow certain lanes and they are very, very restricted. Now, these are the aspects which affect uh, slocks or the commercial shipping in the region. Uh, I'm not sure whether you'll be able to see all this, but hopefully you can. Uh, I've got about 10 issues which affect the slots in the region. Now, some of the aspects of maritime commerce in the Indian Ocean region are that basically, you know, uh, it's a very, very opaque and often incomprehensible, uh, incomprehensible uh, situation for a layman or what we call a land lubber to understand what is really going on and see. Uh, I must tell you that our Indian trade, 94% of Indian trade happens through the seas. 94% by volume and 74% by uh, value. It all goes through the seas. So you, now you see how important sea trade is and how important um, maritime security is. So um, now most of this maximum trade comes through the littorals of the Indian Ocean region. And economic globalization is uh, founded on the bulwark of slock, security, and stability. And there have been some cases where if you interdict the slots, it has a disastrous effect on the economics of the concerned littoral. I told you if this is going to be the uh, statistics as far as the supply chain of uh, maritime trade is concerned. So one of the biggest questions that we can probably discuss uh, and I'll be giving you some examples later on in case this question comes up. Does India require slot patrols, ships to patrol the slots so that nobody can interfere with our shipping lanes? Now, another aspect that we have to consider in maritime security, and I'm talking of mainly issues which are related to maritime trade, 
is choke point security. Now, you see, choke points are regions where all the shipping converges from the high or broad expanses of the seas. They are in narrow areas where interdiction is much more easier. So the shipping becomes very vulnerable. I don't know whether you have heard that uh, the states of Hormuz, I'll be coming to that. If you stop that, the entire world where this energy goes will be directly affected. One of the states, I'll be showing that to you. And mind you, these choke point securities of extreme importance. Long time back, Indonesia stopped the choke point of Makassar for a very short time, 48 hours. Uh, and there was a human cry a uh, long time back. But no country uh, tries that now. And the non-state actors may try this, and that's the worry. Sorry. Yeah, these are the important choke points in the Indian Ocean region. I'll be showing a map, so I won't really read out to them. Um, there is a virtual choke point also just below uh, the Sri Lankan uh, the Sri, Sri Lankan islands, and that is known as Dondra Head. I'm not taking uh, Suez Canal and Turkish Straits into consideration. Yeah, these are the choke points. And what happens if you stop these choke points? These are South Asian choke points. Sunda State, Lombok, uh, Ombai, Vetar, which is a very deep uh, area where the submarines come through this. This is what happens if the choke points are stopped. That is, if the energy, if the commerce is stopped, this is what happens. States of Hormuz, majority of all dependent states. Malacca, Sunda, Lombok, Singapore, Japan, Malaysia, Vietnam, Thailand get affected. Now, how can we overcome this choke point um, uh, problem? That is, we find alternate routes, but are they so easy? They take a long way off if you find an alternate route. Then you can do strategic stocking. That is, uh, I'm, I don't know whether you've heard of the word contago where uh, you have you know, oil that is crude. Crude oil is stocked up at sea with uh, certain very large carriers. And when the conditions are right, we use that. So that is strategic stocking. Convoy protection, this is slot protection. This is what I talked of. It may call for collective management. Then declaration by user states to send the political signal to any state that attempts at shutting down a particular. Uh, it's not very easy, but it can be done. Now, just to give you a view of how much is the trade by sea. In 1999, it was 21,480 billion ton miles. It was supposed to rise to 41,800 in 2014. 2008 happened. And then in 2019, COVID happened. Um, the UN CTAD, which does extensive studies on what happens uh, on maritime trade and transportation, said that there'll be a fall of 4.1% in international maritime trade in 2020. Volumes expanded by only 0.5% in 2019, when they had risen by 2.8% in 2018. Um, the freight rates uh, actually went up in 2020 than they were in 2019. I will not cover this. I've got a full, um, I've got a full lecture on this, but what are the dynamics of various companies? Now, I must tell you, that the Chinese are a superpower as far as shipping is concerned. And so are countries like Singapore, some Gulf countries. They wield enormous influence in 
the shipping industry. India is a very small player, by the way. Now, what is happening in the shipping world? Let me mention this. Um, the ships are becoming bigger and bigger. And now uh, they have reached the new Panamax, uh, the thing of 12,500 TUs, or um, everything is containerized to ultra large containers. And most of the trade in sea is actually carried by containers. So, but it is not that you keep expanding the ships because the port must be capable of handling these large ships. If they can't handle, it is of little use. Now, um, again, what is happening is that most of the trade, and I'll show you um, the next slide here, yeah, the larger ships take this blue line, which is more or less along the equator. And then from there, the freight gets transposed into smaller ships, which act as spokes. And then they go on into the smaller ports. So this is how the shipping world operates. I, I'm not sure if most of you are aware of this. So it's not that the ships go anywhere at, and at any port. The bigger ships go on the blue line. The smaller ships, which act as spokes, go to the smaller other ports. I will skip this LSCI uh, just to tell you it's a measure of the connectivity. And uh, where do we stand? 56.7 in 2020, when the max is 100 for uh, China in 2006. That's the um, index on which everything is based. We are not very high. Uh, I will not go to various types of trade because that will take too much of time. But uh, basically, overall seabound trade consists of bulk cargo and general cargo. And there are four main vessels which carry tankers, bulk carriers, combined carriers and specialist bulk carriers. I'm not going into details because um, I told you, just remember that most of the cargo in ships is carried by containers and the future is just in containers. So 80% of the value of uh, world international seaborne trade is containerized. Now crude oil, this is how the crude oil moves in, in, in the world. Who are the importers? Who are the exporters? This is how LNG or liquefied natural gas moves from which countries? We, of course, are an importing country. Now, um, like I said, our world merchandise exports is just over 1%. And we are not big players in the shipping industry. Our export and import composition, uh, we have diversified, of course, uh, is 70% of manufactured goods are exported. And um, most of the imports are intermediate goods, followed by capital goods. So this is our, what we call the export import composition or mix. Fertilizers, food per items is about 3%. Uh, this gives you an overall picture of what all commodity is there, what all we export or import, basically export iron ore, coal, bauxite, and aluminum. Which all countries do what all? Now, just one aspect which I thought I will highlight. Um, please remember, we have an overwhelming dependence on foreign ships for our exports and imports. At the time of crisis, this can be 
a very big handicap. Uh, we have at currently 1,429 ships as of 2020. And in, this is in comparison to China's more than 8,000 ships, 8,500 ships. So we are really nowhere, but we have to re uh, remove our dependence on foreign ships, because if we don't, then we may be in a bit of a, 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 a problem in times of conflict. Now, I'm nearing the end of my presentation, but um, the, I, I, I can predict that India's shipping will show the highest growth in container movement. And um, as we improve our infrastructure, uh, courtesy, of course, uh, how we are modernizing uh, our ports, courtesy the Sagarmala, um, then hopefully our shipping containers will, uh, will enhance, will be increased. Uh, at current rates, more than 50% of India's containers end up at JNPT near Mumbai. Uh, this, of course, is our annual trade growth projections. POL, as you're very familiar, I don't know, coal, containers, etc. Now, my last two um, slides are, there is an increasingly dependence on West Asia for production of energy. Now, um, I think most of the countries are dependent on this. Uh, containerization has to go up. And in future, the ship sizes are also going to go up. So, um, So I think this is going to be the trend for the future. Um, I've given you what are the other trends, how the shipping will go. Uh, the medium and smaller size are forced to operate on the feeder routes. That will change a little bit. The South-South trade is going to go on and more countries will actively try to increase privatization like what we are doing and infusion of foreign countries into port building infrastructure, what we are also doing. Well, uh, I have more or less finished. In case there are uh, any questions, I think I can take it on uh, during the um, uh, question answer session. So I'll stop the share. I hope uh, I'm well in time. Yes, sir. Thank you very much uh, for your comprehensive overview. Now, let me hand over the platform to Mihir, sir. Uh, okay, okay. Yes, sir. Uh, yes. First of all, I would like to thank the organizers uh, for uh, inviting me to uh, speak on this uh, very pertinent topic. Um, uh, Dr. Ghosh has already given the uh, overview and it actually has... Uh, uh, I, I want... Uh, uh, I won't uh, get into the details of what he has spoken about. And I, I would try and uh, restrict myself to the areas which he hasn't touched upon. Uh, so uh, beginning with uh, uh, the sea lines of communications as uh, uh, Dr. Ghosh uh, mentioned in his uh, presentation, uh, these sea lines are communication are uh, the maritime highways, uh, which we, uh, which we, which uh, through which most of the trade takes place, maritime trade takes place. Uh, these these are uh, the global interactions. These are the uh, places from where the global interactions uh, take place between uh, between the uh, maritime highways. Uh, the uh, it's important to mention here uh, the importance of high seas. The high seas are uh, deemed to be as uh, global commons. Uh, so where all all countries are entitled to have uh, uh, are entitled to equal rights and access to peaceful exploration and resource exploitation. So uh, in maritime laws, uh, high seas uh, include the internal, the ter territorial, the contagious waters, 
and the exclusive economic zones of littoral countries. Uh, these are the crucial, uh, for the high seas are too crucial for global trade and commerce. Uh, they act as maritime highways, as I mentioned. Uh, as maritime trade encompasses uh, various security considerations intertwined with the business, uh, intertwined with the interests of business, governments, and consumers, the interconnectedness makes the transportation network vulnerable for disruptions which affect supply chains uh, that support global commerce and national economies. Uh, in the past two, uh, 50 years, we have seen uh, the uh, global shipping costs have come down, uh, which has uh, encouraged, uh, the, encouraged uh, the dispersion of manufacturing and retail. Uh, so uh, since uh, the SLOC, since li sea lines of communications are vital to the smooth functioning of economies, potential sources of disruption must be examined and addressed uh, as a priority. Now, uh, as uh, uh, Dr. Ghosh's presentation has elaborated and uh, discussed upon uh, the sea lines of communication, the international shipping lines, uh, the choke points, I'm just uh, going to uh, leave you with, I mean, he has already mentioned given the backdrop. So I'm just going to uh, speak about a few uh, areas of uh, and and the recent developments in uh, in some of these choke points. As uh, you can see on the screen, uh, uh, the uh, ch choke points are mentioned: uh, the Suez Canal, uh, the Babel Mandab, Mandeb, uh, the Malacca Strait, the Sunda Strait, Lombok Strait. Uh, these are and also the Cape of Good Hope, Mozambique Channel. These are mainly the uh, choke points which uh, we are referring to, uh, which we are talking about, and uh, they are central to uh, India's trade, uh, India's maritime trade. Uh, so, uh, talking about the Suez Canal, uh, at least 9% of uh, global trade uh, passes from the Suez Canal. Uh, it's the maritime gateway, as you will know, between Europe and Asia. Um, the closure of uh, the Suez Canal uh, could uh, lead to uh, the traffic being diverted to the Cape of uh, Good Hope, uh, thereby uh, increasing the transport cost. So it is the uh, nearest, uh, it's the nearest gateway to uh, Europe from Asia. And um, we, 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 we see, as uh, Dr. Gosham also mentioned, that uh, there have been deep concern uh, for uh, Indian ships here, uh, which have uh, which have been crossing the commercial sh uh, ships which have been crossing to the Suez Channel, especially because of uh, the threats emanating from Yemen recently, uh, where uh, ships navigating in the Red Sea and the Gulf uh, Gulf of Eden, uh, they they uh, uh, they have been threatened increasingly by uh, the situation in Yemen. Another important aspect of this is uh, the Gulf of Eden, is the Somali piracy. Uh, the Gulf of Eden, as you would know, is the southern end of the Red Sea, uh, where it, and it poses a serious threat to commercial shipping in the region, the Somali piracy. Uh, between 2010 and 2014, there were more than 350 attempted or successful attacks on commercial vessels. Um, but uh, in recent past, uh, there have been uh, Navy, there have been coordinated pa patrols by navies uh, from many parts of the world, and uh, the problem has been con contained. But a larger uh, problem in the Suez Canal is the, 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 uh, the place, placing of many uh, navies, uh, which, which has actually uh, made turn that zone into a militarized zone. Uh, there is, UK has a naval base in Bahrain and it has a military training facility in Oman uh, and also has 400 military personnel placed in Kenya. Similarly, France has a, a base in Djibouti and uh, even US has a counter-terrorism base in Djibouti. Now, of all these countries, uh, China has jumped into the bandwagon and it has apparently 
for supporting for apparently supporting anti piracy anti piracy operations it has created a significant base with uh, 2000 personnel so uh, this has actually crowded uh, the suez canal zone and uh, it it in it in a sense threatens uh, the uh, it threatens for a competition between uh, non regional powers uh, india similarly has joined an uh, signed an agreement with japan to to give access uh, which provides access to uh, japanese uh, uh, japanese base in Djibouti. So India has now uh, recently got access to a uh, Japanese base in Djibouti. It's in exchange of Japanese access to military installations in Andaman and Nicobar Islands. So uh, these, uh, these non-actors, these non-regional actors in Suez Canal uh, have, you know, in a sense, uh, if, if the situation escalates, it might, it might lead to a problem. Another uh, important gateway or uh, is the Strait of Hormuz, uh, which connects the Persian Gulf to the Gulf of Oman and Arabian Sea. It, uh, it has, uh, as Sir had also mentioned, it had about 17 million barrels of oil, which passes uh, through this strait every day. So it's important for uh, world's oil trade, this, uh, uh, this point the state of Hormuz. But again, there have been security concer concerns, uh, especially beca because of the tensions between US and Iran. The India has tried to, tried to join uh, one of the initiatives to sort of uh, lessen these uh, tensions. India is participant in uh, the Hormuz peace initiative which seeks to uh, which seeks stability and also has key regional players from uh, including oman india afghanistan and china india has engaged uh, with stakeholders in the gulf to stabilize the strait and us uh, iran confrontations but uh, still this uh, place poses a lot of threat uh, in a sense that uh, in uh, june 2019 Two oil tankers in the strait were damaged by explosions and an attack seen by US, uh, an attack which, which alerted the US and US blamed uh, Iran for these attacks, which Iran has declined. Uh, but India has, uh, India has uh, been alerted and India is taking assistance of Navy to pass through this gateway. So Indian uh, naval, naval ships are escorting uh, the, uh, the cargo ships or the oil tankers which are passing through that gateway. So uh, I'll skip the in international trade part and how much of it is, uh, which, which has already been covered by Sir. Uh, now I come to the in evolving uh, maritime strategy, India's evolving maritime strategy. Only in 2015 uh, did India uh, India release its maritime st st strategy uh, known as ensuring secrecies, India's maritime security strategy. Uh, this is an updated version of the 2007 strategy and it addresses the gap by complementing the evolving security dynamics in the Indian Ocean region and reflecting the bold Indian Navy with a renewed outlook on India's maritime security needs. It, uh, it addresses the new security architecture which we are in, where uh, the rise of China and uh, as a naval power, as uh, a superpower, and it has compelled India to define its strategic interests and review its marit maritime policy. Uh, but there are three key highlights of uh, this, uh, naval, uh, this naval strategy, uh, this naval strategy of India. Uh, the first is uh, the focus on the Indo-Pacific. Uh, the Indo-Pacific, which you know, uh, brings together the Indian Ocean and the Western Pacific, and uh, this uh, creates uh, the. Uh, this brings these two uh, competing geopolitical theaters into one strategic arc. 
So it embraces the Indian Ocean and the Western Pacific together. So this has been reflected in this, uh, in this strategy for the first time. Second, uh, we see that uh, in terms of both uh, the primary and the secondary areas of interest, uh, Indian Navy's areas of interest, they have expanded. The Red Sea pre previously was uh, a secondary area of interest, but has now been accorded a primary status. It has been a primary area of interest now for the Indian Army. Additionally, the Gulf of Oman, the Gulf of Aden, and the littoral regions, the southwestern Indian Ocean, including IOR island states, uh, they're in the eastern Af coast of Africa and littoral regions, uh, are now very much the primary interests of India's maritime security. While Africa and its uh, littoral regions previously were in the second, secondary importance, the Gulf of Oman, Eden, and Southwest Indian Ocean did feature specifically in either of the areas of interest in the maritime doc doctrine. Similarly, the secondary area too has expanded. Uh, now it includes the Southeast Indian Ocean, uh, including sea routes to the Pacific Ocean and littoral regions in the vicinity, the Mediterranean Sea, the western coast of Africa, and then littoral regions. The South China Sea also continues to remain of secondary importance, but adding to the interest uh, that uh, th this is a specific region where East China Sea, Western Pacific Ocean, and their littoral regions have been included. And uh, the Last, the third and the critical development is that India has been accord, India has assumed the role of, of a net security provider. Uh, next, uh, the uh, strategy, uh, I mean, I'm quoting the strategy uh, document. It says the term net security uh, provider describes the state of actual security available in the area upon balancing against the ability to monitor, contain, and counter all of these. So uh, India has assumed the uh, role of a net security provider as per this document. So these are some of the key highlights uh, which, uh, which the uh, strategy document uh, refers to. And uh, from this, uh, there is a clear uh, message uh, that India is willing to play a larger role in unfolding security architecture in the region. I think I'll stop here and if there are any questions, I would like to take any, any further questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Uh, but before that, let me take uh, one question to Dr. Ghosh, sir. So much of the contemporary research shows that, uh, you know, after 1945, US has undid the Indo-Pacific. Uh, even the recent uh, book, uh, The India Way by Dr. Uh, Jay Shankar, uh, says so that uh, the US has undid uh, the Indo Pacific after 1945. And if at all, uh, the, you know, it has to be, re the, if we need to see a greater revival in the Indian Ocean and extended Pacific, uh, the U US can bring strategies uh, to do so. So now that we have a new government with a new ideology, uh, what do you think some of the contemporary changes that we are seeing and what we could see in the near future? Thank you, sir. Over to you. You know, this issue about Indo-Pacific, and I will not, of course, get into the intense debate um, uh, which surrounds its origins, because there's an intense debate. And I can assure you, it goes back to a person called uh, Hoshawa, who was the first person to ever use the term, uh, he's German. Um, Indo-Pacific, but that apart, um, you know, this Indo-Pacific is um, amorphous concept and it makes a lot of sense for the United States to espouse its cause. That is, for them, it's a sense of continuum. That is, from, in, uh, from Pacific Ocean, you come directly into the Indian Ocean. In fact, I have a probably 45 minute lecture just on Indo-Pacific and how it's evolving into its present format and uh, 
in the quad format, which has been talked of quite a bit, but we have latched on to it. Um, knowing that our capabilities do not really, it's an aspirational role, especially beyond the Indian Ocean. Our uh, hard assets do not permit us to go beyond the Indian Ocean in many meaningful manner. We are trying. We are the largest Navy. I'm not talking of United States, uh, but other than that, we are the largest Navy in the uh, Indian Ocean region. Um, largest maritime asset. Now we are moving over to the Pacific and it's a sort of natural flow. But um, you see, in keeping with our growing influence, uh, Mihir mentioned uh, how we have uh, uh, talked about it in our maritime doctrine. Uh, I was one of the authors of that maritime ensuring, uh, you will see my name in small print in the uh, 2000, uh, in the 2015 uh, maritime doctrine. Um, you know, our influence is growing. So it makes sense for us to get onto this bandwagon and uh, get onto this Indo-Pacific. But just a word, if a person is interested going more into this Indo-Pacific uh, conundrum, so to say, there's an article of mine in the Naval War College Review of United States um, last year. And we have underlined as to what does Indo-Pacific mean for India? How are we going about it? But I would just finish by saying that we have to get onto this bandwagon. It's an amorphous concept. What we understand by Indo-Pacific is not what the US understands by Indo-Pacific. It's not what the Australians or the Japanese understand by Indo-Pacific. For them, it makes sense, of course, because Japan is at the fulcrum. Australia is at the fulcrum. So we have to uh, get onto this bandwagon and I fully support it. And let's hope that we continue to sort of espouse this cause. Uh, thank you, sir. Let me, the, let me take now the question to Mihir, sir. Uh, would connectivity initiatives between AIC and Andaman promote bilateral patrolling between India and Indonesia in Malacca Strait? Okay, uh, between India and Indonesia, there is something known as Ind Indo Pact or bilateral joint patrolling, which is really infrequent. We have tried to do slot patrols in the Malacca Straits, and there has been some um, uh, sort of a uh, pushback from some of the littorals in the Malacca Straits, mainly Malaysia. I know because I faced it. So um, will the connectivity initiative between Akche and Andaman promote bilateral patrolling? Uh, yes and no, in the sense that one bilateral patrolling already exists, it may be enhanced, but this, if you remember, between Andaman and Akche is hardly any distance. And now we are patrolling uh, that area with much more frequency. They are using Donias, they are using uh, surface ships to patrol that area, and the distance not being very far, it may, that may not enhance the patrolling per se, but what we have to keep in mind is that we have to enhance our slot patrols in the region and try and take on board all the littorals of the Malacca Straits. As it is, the Malacca Strait littorals carry out something known as, uh, they do carry out patrolling, eyes in the sky, part one, part two, but, <clears throat> sorry, uh, we probably would like to get involved a little more into the patrolling bit of Malacca Strait because it's important for us. Let me take one last question before I, uh, before I conclude, sir, because I feel this is very important to also know. Uh, what is the future of uh, Sagar and uh, Mausam project that uh, India is trying to initiate? The Sagar and Mausam project. I would be happy for any of your answers, sir. 
Nair, would you like to take it on? What do you want me to do? The Saga project. Uh, the future uh, of Sagar and Mosem project, you mean to say. Uh, as you would know that yesterday itself, uh, the Prime Minister, uh, uh, Mr. Modi, he uh, inaugurated the Maritime India Summit, uh, where he, he emphasized upon uh, the Sagar uh, project and uh, the investments which are, which are, uh, which are lined up. Uh, he, he, India seeks to uh, increase um, in investments from uh, global investments. It try, it's trying to uh, pull, attract more and more global investments uh, into uh, this. And the uh, Sagar port, uh, as, as, or the Sagar Mala, the, uh, the, the, uh, the chain of ports which, which uh, India is trying to uh, create, these are crucial in in India's uh, scheme, and uh, uh, the Mosem project, uh, as uh, you would know, again is focused on the Indian Ocean region, and uh, it it seeks to uh, it seeks to actually uh, build to take forward civilizational relations and uh, the, uh, the 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 cultural connectedness uh, between uh, the literal states, Indian Ocean. Uh, literal states and uh, India. So I think these both projects uh, have a bright future in terms of uh, in terms of India's uh, strategy uh, or India's maritime strategy. Yes. Yeah. Sir would like to add. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, what we have said was absolutely right. Um, you know the Saga project. Uh, was essentially an effort to take along um, most of the littorals in the Indian Ocean region. One of the initiatives was initially the IONS project or the initiative which I talked of, right? uh, Indian Ocean Naval Symposium, which has grown now. Uh, we started it in 2008. Uh, again, uh, I was one of the uh, authors of that. Um, and it has now grown quite a bit. Uh, then in, when Prime Minister Modi felt that it is necessary that we have multilateralism. The thing is that we not only help these smaller countries in maritime capacity building, but also take them on onto a particular platform. So he started the Saga project, which I think is very good. Um, efforts in this direction had already started, by the way. Um, not particularly Saga, but multilateralism, in which the NSAs of all uh, the littorals were coming together to discuss maritime security. So in a way, Saga had already been conceived much earlier. And then you gave it a nice name. and. Uh, of course, it became Saga. As far as the Mosem project is concerned, now I have a, a little bit of a reservation as far as Mosem is concerned, because, and I can wait this to, of course, the ME, um, in which I always felt that initially, you know, they started this project as a, a rebound or uh, a response to the BRI, or not really the BRI, but the Maritime Silk Route, MSR, the 21st century Maritime Silk Route, which was passed, which was taken up by the Chinese. So we thought we must do something. And then all of a sudden, somebody in the uh, MEA got a bright idea, let's start this Mossum. There were a lot of outgrowths of this Mossum project, and at that time, I was looking into BRI and OBOR, that is what's at that time known. Um, uh, MSR was a part of BO, and there are a lot of problems in that, but that's another story. So we suddenly came up with this Mossum project, and they caught hold of a person and they said, okay, make out something. Uh, it was not really very well thought of. So I'm not really sure. Uh, now it has, of course, evolved a bit 
but how uh, it took a different turn, cultural, there's that. But um, I'm, I'm, I'm not to be quoted on this because this is not meant to be sort of uh, shared in that. So please don't quote me when you're writing this. <laughs> Uh, this is the inner sort of wheels which I'm revealing to you. Um, so I'm not too sure about the Mossum project. I hope it uh, becomes much more evolved, much more defined, because you need specifics. You need a concrete idea. So I hope it re reaches that. Uh, Sagar, of course, is shaping up very well. And I'm quite certain that uh, we will take and reach uh, multilateralism in a big way in the Indian Ocean region. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Thank you, both of the speakers, for your uh, valuable insights. Uh, by this, we come to the end of the session. It was very resourceful, inclusive, and interactive. Uh, I thank both of the speakers for he being here. It was an honor being in conversation with you. And we look forward for much more uh, engagement with you.